your keynote, your countdown, your time. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Uh, the first thing that I want to say is that I like didn't sleep a wink last night because I was so, so excited for this. And so I hope that uh, by the end of the two hours that we have here today together, you'll see why I was so excited. Um, so the next thing I want to say is welcome to the Web Design Decal. <laughs> My name is Andy, but um, I'm going to uh, talk about myself a little bit later. Uh, and first, I guess I'll try to talk about you. Uh, if you're in this class, I certainly hope that you are a person who uh, attempted to do web design, right? So you tried to read the tutorials, uh, but upon going through the tutorials, you found some word that was confusing, and you had to look that up. And then in that definition, you found something likewise confusing, and you had to look that up too, right? And then it just kept on going and going, and it was just a very hard, kind of not very beginner-friendly process. Is, is that more or less the, uh, the sentiment I gather from this class? I hope that is, because you shouldn't be a total expert, right? Uh, and so this is really um, a class for total beginners. Uh, but you know, because we are for beginners, we're also really popular. I, I, mean, I mean really popular. 905 people this semester try to get into this course. So what that means is that for every person you see in here, uh, about eight or so people uh, were not, we weren't able to accept because this room only holds uh, people without creating like a crazy safety hazard, right? So 905 people, which results in an acceptance rate of some 11% or so, which is about, it's about half of universally. So it's, uh, it's really tough. So congratulations, you guys. I mean, this, this is really awesome that, uh, that you were able to write s some awesome applications. Uh, and for those of you at home, we, we Definitely hope you can apply again, because uh, we'd appreciate seeing your faces again. <clears throat> uh, so the great thing is that you're in. So you know, can I get a round of applause for yourselves? Congrats. <laughs> I think we'll have a great time. This will be awesome. Uh, but the thing is that, that you know, we really care about, about web design decal, or as I like to call it, WDD, because it's, uh, it's a lot shorter and faster. Uh, and we sort of felt this, this guilt about having so many people, or having to turn away, uh, turn away uh, so many people that we thought you know, possibly could have been good fits for this class. Uh, we really didn't want to confine WDD just to the limits of this, of this physical classroom. We, went, we wanted to do our best uh, to, to try to broadcast this to anyone who, who has an internet connection. Anyone who has an internet connection should be able to, to learn how to build beautiful websites, is, it was the vision. And so, with that, uh, I'd like to announce something. Uh, and before I do, I'd, I'd like a drum roll. You think you guys could, could help me out? Just give me a quick drum roll. Yeah? The best part about tonight is that we are live. We are live! <laughs> Woo! Uh -uh. I just want to make it clear how exciting that is. Because, like, literally, you know, you don't even have to be uh, enrolled at Berkeley or, or even in the United States. As long as you have an internet connection, you can join us here. And so, also, for you at home, uh, feel free to, to ask questions in the YouTube, uh, the YouTube live section, and someone on here will be on those questions, and uh, they'll ask them occasionally. So, you're part of this, too. So, yeah, that's crazy. Uh, now I'm going to hand it over to my colleague slash uh, uh, partner in crime to talk about why we do what we do. So here's Sean Park. <clears throat> okay, hey everyone, my name is uh, Sean Park. I'm the design instructor for Web Design Decal. Um, let me first talk about why you should learn web design. Um, so admit, like, you spend countless amount of time on the internet. You spend time on Facebook, you know, some of you are guilty, uh, most of you actually. and um, from the Facebook to uh, more productive things like Google Drive and Gmail, a lot of our life revolves around the internet. And in fact, our technologies, like from smartphones and laptops and to tablets and even watches I'm there today, a lot of our technologies revolve around using the internet. And it's because the internet is full of rich information for us to discover. Um, and that's why it is extremely important for us to learn how to 
convey this information in a beautiful and an easy to use way. Like it's a cs 6 b website. I mean, I've taken cs 6 b it's an awesome course, and I love Prof Professor Chutuk, and I love this class, but it's not the most beautiful, or nor is it the, the easiest to use website. And that's why it is important not just to know how to create a website, but to create a beautiful website. And, and um, or a website that is that has a great imp great first impression through a great user aesthetics, and a website that is very easy to use through a great user experience. And in this class, we want to teach you everything you need to learn how to make not just a website but a beautiful website. So why do we teach web design? Why do we hold this decal, and why do we spend countless amount of time planning this decal and planning this webcast and everything? It's because We've all ran into something like this before, where you type in Google how to make a website or how to center an element, and so on and so forth. And I tried using Code Academy, I tried using W3, W3 schools and stuff, but they're nothing more than a reference manual, like a dictionary, rather than a step by step guide. And even if you eventually discover how to make a website through Googling, you end up with something like this. Because you know how to make a website, sure, you know how to make a website, but it's not necessarily the most beautiful. It's, you don't know how to, where to position things, you don't, know how, you don't know what color to use and stuff, and you end up with something like this. And trust me, like, when I first started web design, like, I ended up creating something like this. And it was pretty bad. So we figured that our vision is to create a go-to resource for anyone who wants to create a beautiful website. And we need something like the Stanford iOS course, where um, if, you, if someone asks you, where do I learn web design? Where do I learn how to make a beautiful website? You can point to a resource, like the web design decal. There's this awesome resource called web design decal, where you can learn how to make a website and how to make a beautiful website. So how do we do that? It's, we do this through our curriculum. It's divided into two sections. Number one is our programming section. In our programming section, that's the first hour from 7 to 8 p.m., we teach you all the tools you need to make a website. That is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. We're going to go in order. And you're going to learn what these all means, what HTML means, what uh, CSS means, and what JavaScript means, what they all do um, today. Um, and then we're going to go through them one by one throughout this semester. And in design section, we supplement the tools you've learned in the programming section by teaching you how to make it beautiful. That is, um, in the first half of the course, we teach you the aesthetics part. That is, positioning, <coughs> spacing, typography and images, and color. And, and then, in the second half of the course, we teach you the user experience. And I think that what separates user interfaces from plain art forms is that it has to make, you have to use the, the design to enhance user behavior. And that's why I think user experience is just as important, if not more important, than the aesthetics of a website. So that's what we're going to cover in the second half of this course. So with these tools, we want to give you the confidence to code. We want, to give you, we want this to be like an entry to practical programming for a lot of you. In fact, from your applications, more than half of this class have never had a programming experience. So we think that this course would be a great entry point for you who wants to learn programming. And we think that we want to give you the confidence to design, because I am a UI designer, but I've, um, I've just graduated. Um, but I've found it difficult to find a very good, a lot of both quality and quantity of user interface classes in UC Berkeley. And I think that this class would be a great entry point for those of you who want to go into user interface design. And with these tools, we want to give you the confidence to create, to create any website that you want, from promotional websites for your clubs or events, to personal websites like your blog, and even the next Google, like a web application. So our ultimate vision is to, our goal is to create something like this, or even better, and I believe that every one of you have the potential to make it happen. So, whoa. So um, I guess, I kind of fuck up the slides, but um, let me just talk about who I am. Uh, again, my name is Sean Park. I, um, I've just graduated from UC Berkeley um, this May, 
And um, three quick facts about myself. Number one, I, uh, I was born in Ulsan, Korea. And I moved to Houston, Texas when I was 11. And I came, to, uh, I came back to Korea when it, for high school, and now I'm here. So a lot of moving back and forth. And second, um, I have a degree in computer science. And I consider that to be one of the miracles in my life because <laughs> I consider myself a UI designer, not a computer scientist. And a lot of the courses that I've taken is like very minimum requirements to meet that degree. And all of the other courses were entrepreneurship and design and other courses. And um, I'm, I'm, I, I feel pretty fortunate to graduate right now with a computer science degree. And the third thing would be, um, what am I doing now that I've graduated? I spend 35% of my time on the web design decal. And 65% of my time is spent on my startup called Iris. Um, to talk about Iris a little bit, um, Iris, it's basically a search engine for people's ideas. It's a search engine for people's blogs. And I mentioned some details about Iris and what we do and the user in interfaces that the, the thought process behind the user interfaces of Iris um, throughout this lecture as an example. I've also worked at Free Ventures um, as a designer. And, um, and they are a student-run incubator for UC Berkeley. So if you're interested in creating a startup, um, I highly encourage you to apply for Free Ventures. And I've also worked at CET, Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. It's also an uh, incubator. It gives you free office space. And again, if you're interested in building startups, I suggest checking CET out. All right, this is the part where uh, I talk about myself a little bit. <laughs> Uh, so my name is Andy Chin. I will be your programming instructor for this semester. Uh, and a couple of fun facts about myself. Uh, I was born in Austin, Texas. So that's the, the capital of Texas, the, the most exciting part of Texas, I would say. But um, even, even though it is, I'd still, when I moved to California at age uh, 13, I found that California is actually a lot better. So I, s I said it live. But yeah, it's true. It's, it's kind of true. Um, the second thing, here's another fun fact. Uh, I took this course last year, and um, I was actually the very last person on the cutoff. Like, like here's the cutoff, and there's, there's me, and I just barely got in. Uh, and actually, when they, when they first got the first round of results and, and they, they had it, they realized there were way too many girls, right? So they had to cut off a lot of girls and bring in some more guys. So I'm only in because I'm a male. So, <laughs> like, that's, like, I'm credible. Trust, trust me, I'm credible. But, um, yeah, I, I took it a year ago. Uh, it was really exciting then, and well, I hope it's exciting now, too. Um, the third and final thing is that uh, one of my life goals is to go to space. Uh, I, 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 maybe as, as little as for a vacation, but hopefully, I guess, to eventually retire on Mars or something like that. I don't know if there's any um, SpaceX fans in here or Occupy Mars uh, believers. <laughs> but if there are... <coughs> so, yeah, those are three things about me. Uh, I've worked on a couple of things too. A um, couple of things I've worked on, something called Code Prep. So uh, Code Prep Code School was a, a small computer science school that I started in my hometown with my best friend. Uh, we, we had, I think, about two rounds of, of uh, classes, and then we had to discontinue it due to a lot of complications with distance, because I, I live in Southern California. Uh, and so back and forth stuff is kind of tough. But we did have two classes, and those were really fun. And I learned a, a hell of a lot. So, um, you know, code prep, that was one of the things I did. I also uh, interned at CET. Uh, you know, Sean, Sean helped me get into that one. Uh, and that was, that was when I actually did web design for uh, a job for the first time. So that was really exciting. Um, and this past summer, I worked at Apple. Uh, I worked on the, the services division where I worked on this product. Um, and a lot of times people ask me, um, when's the next iPhone coming out? And I can tell you, it's today, duh. <laughs> so, yep. So uh, let's talk about our amazing team. So um, the, the guy who leads the design section is Sean Park. So Sean will tell you more about them. Cool. Um, um, our, again, our class have never, is, would not have been possible without our TAs. They have spent so much time, over six to eight hours, more than typical decals. And it, it's, I'm so grateful to have this team as our on board to teach the design section. So um, go around one by one. All right, hi, my name is Hamza, and I'm a second year computer science major here at Berkeley. Uh, I'm an international student from Saudi Arabia, so if you want to learn about a country like that, you can come and talk to me. 
Um, in my spare time, I like to play FIFA. I also have an intramural team that I, it's called King Abdul after Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I really like web design. And I took this course last semester. And honestly, I think I spend more time on it than all my classes combined. But it's done good things for me, you know. And I think if you're really interested in web design too, you should do the same. Hi. Hi, I'm Ingrid. I'm a third year um, computer science and cognitive science major. Um, on my, at my spare time, I do design. I actually teach the Photoshop and Illustrator decal tomorrow. So my Tuesdays and Wednesdays are pretty packed. But if you have any questions about design, when you're designing a website, you can talk to me about like fonts, colors, and we can talk. Yeah. And I took this class also last year, and now I'm teaching it. And fun fact, I was waitlisted, but I got in. So, <laughs> so. Don't fear if you're if you're here, you can learn. Yeah. <laughs> so while we're on the topic of stories re relating to waitlist and applications, I was actually the number one candidate. Um, but I don't know how this is possible because my application consisted of I really like the following things: eating, sleeping, eating, and sleeping. So again, I have no idea how I got in. Um, thanks, Jeff and Kevin and Sean. Um, this is my second time TAing for this course. Um, in my spare time, I'm also a TA for CS6 UNB. So yay, data structures. <laughs> yeah, but anyways, um, I love web design as well in addition to Java. Um, yeah, this course teaches a lot of really practical things. Um, after taking it, I got my first um, job at Lawrence Berkeley doing websites. So a lot of cool things. Yeah, come talk to me if you want. So now I'd like to introduce the other half, uh, my team, the uh, programming team TAs. So uh, let's give a hand as they come up. Uh, hi, guys. My name's Philip. Uh, I'm currently a senior studying industrial engineering. Um, yeah, I don't know how I got in this class, because I'm not even CS. Well, I mean, I don't know how I got to be a TA, because I'm not even CS. I'm the only non-CS TA. But I've learned a lot, and it all started from getting into this class. So. You guys are on the right track to doing something great. Hi, everyone. I'm Adam. I'm a second year from Casablanca, Morocco. Um, during my free time, I like making sexy websites and playing basketball. Uh, I took this class my first semester here, and I really liked it. So hopefully, you guys will enjoy it as much as I did. Um, hello. Hey, my name is Tomas. I was uh, born and raised in Lima, here in Peru. Este, I'm a JavaScript developer, uh, and I'm interested in, in also pre-computer interfaces, how to how to create uh, silky smooth interfaces, and how 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 we can interact in a more uh, este intuitive uh, way with technology. Uh, that's it. all the cringy and introductory stuff. Let me just talk about the actual class. So the class, again, is to be on Tuesday, 7 to 9 PM, 306 SOTA, HBO Auditorium. And again, the first hour will be programming section. Um, 8 to 9 PM will be design section. Um, and it makes sense because in the programming section, you learn how to make a website. And then in design section, we enhance that by teaching you the design theories to make it beautiful. And again, because this is a two-unit decal, you can only offer you a pass non-pass credit. Hopefully, this class becomes an official course. That way, we can give you a uh, letter grade. Um, and we offer you lower division and upper division credits. Um, and how many of you have signed up for Telebears already? I guess a, a better way would be, how many of you have not signed up for Telebears right now? OK. So I highly suggest that you, I, um, you should actually uh, sign up for Telebears ASAP by the first week. We're going to go through the roster. And if you have not signed up for Telebears, we are going to have to kick you off the, off the official roster. So please sign up for Telebears ASAP by next week. Okay? And the grading for this class is divided into three parts. Number one is final project. It's going to account for 45%. This would be anything you want. You can create any website that you want. Uh, whether it's a promotional website, a, a personal website, a blog, or even a, a web app, if you have the time. 
Um, and the next will be a group project. Final project will be towards the end of the semester. Group project is mid-semester. For this, we usually do a redesign of an existing website that a lot of people use, but that doesn't really look good or has a terrible user interface. So in fall 2013, we did a Craigslist. Um, last semester, we did Reddit. This semester, we haven't decided what to work on it yet. Um, we're going to tell you sometime next week or the week after. And there will be homework assignments. There are a total of eight homeworks. And those account for 20% of the grade. And um, you must, the grading scheme is pretty simple. If you get 70 or, or above, you pass. Otherwise, you fail. And um, you have two unexcused absences and two excused absences. And Andy will later tell you today how to deal with, how to submit an absence request and so on. And if you need help, we use this thing called Piazza. How many of you do not know Piazza? Does everyone here know Piazza? That's cool. So Piazza is basically a question and answer platform for teachers and students. And um, you can sign up for Piazza. We are going to send you an invite to Piazza sometime today. And if you post a question on Piazza, we're going to try to answer your questions within 24 hours. And when you ask questions, please post screenshots so that we can better understand your questions. Because sometimes what students did was they were like, oh, my website is broken. And I'm like, what do you mean it's broken? We don't know what you mean when you say it's broken. So please post a screenshot so that we know what the error is. But do not post actual code, like uh, actual screenshots of your code or um, snippets of the code because other people might copy from your code. Um, so just post screenshots of how it looks on the web browser. And what we did since fall 2013 was we've had office hour for a decal, and which is great because you can just like come if you have any questions that you need to be answered offline in person, you can just come to office hour on 3 to 5 p.m. on Sunday at FSM next to Moffitt Library, and um, yeah. And Andy will talk about uh, one more announcement. Yeah, so there's one more thing that uh, we'd like to talk about. Uh, so I, I hope that it, at least it's, it's starting to become clear that, that we, the, the TAs and the instructors of Web Design Decal, uh, really, really care about this course. Like, you know, for me, it's like the reason that I get up in the morning. It's really, really exciting to me. No, seriously, like, you know, it's no joke. Um, you know, we really care about every single detail of the student experience, both here and at home. Uh, and so, the one more thing I want to talk about is a pretty important question when it comes to uh, organizing the class, and that is, uh, you know, what, what do we choose for our, our, our class software? Because that's pretty important, I'd say. I mean, here, like, the fraction of time that you're actually in the lecture is relatively small compared to the total amount of time you spend on the class. So, um, you know, do, do we go traditional, and did we settle with uh, BSpace? Uh, do we like clunky software that is def doesn't often work? I won't bash too much. Uh, <laughs> no, we didn't. <laughs> we, di we didn't go with that. Do, do we use Canvas? Uh, slightly better, but not good enough for web design decals. So uh, we, we didn't use Canvas either. Instead, we're proud to announce that we created our own homebrew software. And we call it Portal. <laughs> Very quickly, you can just call it Portal or WDD Portal, but essentially, it's the one place students can go to for their lorem ipsum adventure. Uh, and in case you don't know what lorem ipsum is, it's essentially uh, randomly generated strings that you use to place hold for large amounts of text. Uh, if you don't know about it now, you'll use it soon, I guess, when you start making websites. But it's your lorem ipsum adventure here. So uh, yeah, we have our own software, and this is what it looks like. Yeah? What do you think? I mean. We hope that the, uh, the user interface is a little bit more clear than, than the choices of software that we, that we could have had but, but didn't use. Um, in here, you can see that it's pretty easy. You can see your latest grade, uh, what your current grade in the class is. Uh, you, can, you can see the, the, uh, le the lecture materials, and you can download them all. And uh, we also have uh, an attendance system uh, unique to this class, and it's, it's, it's our lorem ipsum system. So basically, um, to prove that, that all of you were in class, and not just uh, watching the live webcasts. Uh, you, have to, you have to come in here, and, and eventually you'll have to enter a, a secret lorem ipsum word, one of the random words uh, that we give out during class, just to confirm that you were here. So we'll talk more about that later. And, and don't worry about this time. 
uh, we'll, we'll be clear for this time because we had uh, registration outside. So um, that's uh, this is one shot. This is what the uh, the attendance uh, section looks like. As you can see at the very bottom, it's it's very clear as to what happened on what week, at least from our perspective. You know, did you attend? Uh, were you excused from attending, or did you just not show up? Now you can know what we think. So no mysteries here. Uh, no more Google Forms. No more eye clickers. Uh, no more, you know, old-fashioned pen and pencil to see who's who's in and who's not. Um, and like I said, you know, all the materials that we use in this class, so everything from the slides that we have to uh, even um, even uh, sample code that we use in class, it'll all be here. So we'll be sure to to share it all with you so that you don't lose anything from this class. So um, I really want to recognize a couple people from this team because uh, three months ago this software did not exist at all. Like I said, this is totally. Uh, homebrew software, so it was built in-house for the purpose of, of making the experience really great for you guys. So I want to specifically recognize Sean Park, my uh, colleague, <laughs> partner in crime. <laughs> Philip Sue uh, played a huge role in the back end. Sarah Kim, the invincible Sarah Kim. Uh, and finally, Tomas Vega. Tomas. Tomas. That was the team that, that willed this project into existence. Uh, so now that now it's here, and now you can use what we hope is a significantly better experience when it comes to navigating your course. So um, yeah, homebrew, homebrew software. All right. Can I answer anyone's questions as of right now? Question. OK, so the question was, how do we access the portal? Uh, great question. We'll actually be going over that in your first homework. Your first homework will entail that you, um, well, first of all, we wrote this tiny little tutorial as to how to use it. Um, and so part of your homework is actually to create an account uh, and begin using it right away. And you'll submit your homework actually through portal. So yeah, any other question? Uh, so you know, we, uh, we don't like to fail people. Like, you know, we're not that mean. But sometimes, you know, you just, sometimes people give us no choice. So. Um, uh, I think it was about 10% or so, 5% because five, five we also had 100 people last time, so f five people failed 5%. Uh, but here's a little interesting caveat about this semester when I said something that I immediately regretted. Uh, but I, I said, and I told the team this too, that if, if nobody fails uh, this semester of the web design decal, then I will willingly uh, get a perm like, <laughs> like Sean has. So. Uh, <laughs> I said it as a joke, but they immediately, you know, took it seriously and they ran away with it. And now, uh, now, now I get to get a perm. If, 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 <laughs> unless I grade hard, uh, then yeah, just throwing it out there. Uh, any other questions? All right. Well, I hope uh, we were clear. If you have any other questions and they come up later, again, we have our piazza. I hope you're signed up. If if not, you can always look for it. CS ninety eight one ninety eight web design decal. Uh, or you can email any one of us. Uh, so, yeah. All right, now I'm going to hand it over to Sean to talk about websites. OK, so this is, now we're going to start our main ad phrase for this course, for this lecture today. Um, we're going to start off with the definition of a website. I mean, it's as, as really like hard as it seems. Like, it's like on the first day of class in almost every lecture you go to, you're going to have to answer a question like, what is a data structure? What is a database? What is an operating system? You're going to do this for the sake of formality, OK? So a website is basically a set of web pages from a, served from a single domain. So what does that mean? It's basically like a folder. You know, um, let's say if, you have a, if you're taking an English class, you have a folder that contains all of your essays. And in this case, a, an essay is pretty much a web page, like an HTML file. And a website is a folder that, that contains all these uh, essays or the web pages. You probably use a very, very easy analogy. And a domain would be an address that represents a server where the files are located. So uh, a domain like a www.wdd.io, that's basically, it's just an address. So to give you an example, um, so when you type in the address, say www.wdd.io, what the web browser does is it goes, it looks up the address. Because it's an address, it goes to um, for to use a physical analogy, it goes to 2211 Channing Way, Berkeley, California. And um, it, 
it goes to that address and it fetches the file. So it, when you go to the address, it looks up the folder and it says that there's a folder that contains these four files and it fetches the file that's required to load the website. And when it loads the website, it looks gibberish. To us, right now, it looks gibberish. It's a bunch of code and um, the website magically renders this code to a web page. And you don't have to know how the website <laughs> renders the code from this state to this state. That's all taken care of by the web browser itself, so thanks to Google God. And um, so all you have to worry about is writing the code necessary to make a website. So that's how a website is shown to your web browser. So a website is made of two parts. Number one is front end, number two is back end. In the front end, it's everything that the user can see. So these include buttons, images, and text. So if you go to Facebook, you see this like button, the, the search bar and everything. Everything that you can see, it's a front end. And everything that the users cannot see is, we call it the back end. So what happens when the user clicks on the like button? How does that add, get added to the Facebook's database? Everything that's related to the, to the business logic is taken care of by the back end. And in this class, we're only going to cover the front end, that is what users can see. And if you know, by the end of this class, you should be able to create a solid, static, uh, front-facing website, but not quite enough to create a web application like uh, a Facebook or a Google. So if you're interested in learning about the back end part of the website, I suggest checking out the Ruby on Rails decal. Um, and I think it's the Programming Field of Power decal and CS618. And within front end, it's broken apart into three sections. Number one is HTML, number two, two is CSS, number three is JavaScript. And what's great about web design is that all of these three languages have serve its own purpose very, very clearly. What HTML does is it provides a structure for your website. So think of it as a skeleton. And what CSS does is it provides a design for your website. So when HTML provides a raw document, like a Word document, if you apply the CSS to it, it suddenly becomes beautiful. It's like a clone. And um, what JavaScript does is it provides a function. So when you click on a button, a popover will appear. When you click on a button, a, a new box will appear. All these functions is taken care of by the JavaScript. So to go over these one by one, again, HTML provides a structure. Um, and if you write a very good HTML code, this, even, even if you don't have a CSS star sheet, the website should be pretty understandable. And I'll show you why. So um, this is a typical HTML file. Um, this is the HTML file that we use for our own website. And you might not know what this all means right now, but Andy will go over what this means in the latter half of today. And um, CSS provides the design of the page. So what's really cool about CSS, personally, is that it's a code. It's a programming language. It's not quite a programming language. It's a markup language. That pro it's just several lines of code, but this code is enough to create this beautiful interface and, and art forms and designs and sh from shapes, colors, buttons, and images. And to me, it's really cool that you use code technology to generate artwork. So to give you an example, this is a typical CSS code that we use. No frameworks. If you know SAS or less, this is no other frameworks. It's just plain CSS. And if you take our website, wdd.io, and if you get rid of the CSS, this is what it'll look like without the CSS. <coughs> and again, even if we don't have the CSS, as I mentioned, even if we just have the HTML, the document is fairly understandable. You have a title because it's bold and big, web design decal. And you have a link because that's underlined. Um, have home, WDD live, have questions and stuff like that. But if you apply CSS to this raw HTML page, it suddenly becomes like this. Some, with some voodoo magic CSS that you learned in this class, your website goes from this to this with just some several with not just some several lines of code, but a, a several few thousand lines of code, it becomes like this. Um, and how about Facebook? Let's say you have this Facebook page, and if you get rid of the CSS, it looks like this. Again, it's fairly understandable, a title, Facebook, italic, pretty big, and it's a link and everything. 
and you get you can see the friend requests and like I can confirm and like ignore. But this is Facebook without the CSS. If you strip the CSS, the design goes away and it just becomes like a Word document. So that is the power of CSS and design. And um, lastly, JavaScript provides the function of the page. So a question would be, what would happen to a website if you stripped the JavaScript? If you stripped the CSS from this website, your, the website became like this. So what, if, what would happen to Facebook if I took away the JavaScript? Anyone can guess? Yeah. You can click on it. Nothing's stopping the user from clicking the button. Yeah, exactly. So what will happen is, let's say you have this Facebook, and I click on the Like button. If you take away the JavaScript, it's not going to do anything. It's going to stay there. So again, if you had HTML, no design. If you had CSS, it looks good and everything, but it's not going to work. So that would be the roles that HTML, CSS, and JavaScript plays on the website. So this would be a typical JavaScript file. Um, this is the file that we use for our website. And this JavaScript file is not plain JavaScript. We use a framework with jQuery. And in this class, we are going to be teaching you JavaScript and jQuery. And we're primarily going to use a framework with jQuery because this makes your lives, this makes people who are not that good with programming like me really easy to use JavaScript. So if there are three things you should remember from this section of lecture today, you should remember that a website is broken into three parts, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And HTML provides the structure, CSS provides the design, it makes it look good, and JavaScript provides function, it makes it work. So those are the three things you should remember. And um, we'll have 10, 15 minutes of break, and we will start the programming lecture in a few minutes. Thank you. The music on.
Thank you. 
All right, everyone, I hope you had a fun break. Um, before I continue and talk about uh, HTML, uh, I have a list here of names that uh, we have as not here. So just in case you somehow um, didn't check in, uh, let, let me just go through this list of names right now and tell me that if you actually are here. So I have uh, Alyssa Hasdarnkel. Alyssa Hasdarnkel. Andrew Wang. Is Andrew Wang here? Emily Zhang. C H E N G. Uh, Huan Yi Zhang. Here. Okay. Be sure to make your presence known to uh, a TA nearby. Uh, Jin Sung Kim. Jin Sung Kim. Uh, Rachel Namson. Rachel Sao. T S A O. Rachel Sao. And finally, uh, Varsha Venkat Subramanian. Here. Okay. All right. Just precaution, just so we don't accidentally uh, mark you not here. So yeah, in, in case you are here, please try to go to the nearest TA and make your existence known. 
All right. Let's talk about hypertext markup language, also known as HTML, the premier language of the web, what the vast majority of the web is written in. It's really HTML and, and XML. Uh, and some, I guess maybe there's something else that I'm missing. But really, like, it's HTML, right? So just like Sean said, this is really kind of for, uh, formality. If we're teaching web design, we really have to go over these, these basics. So bear with me if you feel like uh, it's, it's relatively slow. But uh, for anyone who knows HTML, they know that, that HTML really is just uh, nothing but tags, right? So, so what are tags? Um, tags look like this. They are pretty much 100% of the time going to be an anchor tag. Um, w and then you're going to have some word. In this case, that word is body. But there's also a bunch of other ones like P uh, and A and, uh, and link and a whole bunch of others that we're about to go over. And they have differing functions. But the point is, is that they all, for the most part, look like this. Um, for the most part, they also have pairs. There's the opening tag, in this case, the one on the left, the, the body on the left. And there's a closing tag, which also says body, but it, di it differs because you have this slash here. And what that slash indicates is that uh, it's the ending tag. So typically, you know, you'll have something like this. Well, you have one opening tag, and then in the middle, you'll have some content. And that content uh, will basically fall under the rules of the tag, uh, and then it'll be closed off. So in total, we call that an element. So you know, if you have both the tags and whatever it's working on and the end tag, uh, we, you know, just basic vocabulary, it's, it's called an HTML element. So uh, essentially, every HTML document that you've ever seen, whether it be uh, Google.com, uh, Facebook, or, or even your own, uh, they all have sort of the same, you can almost guarantee that they all look like this uh, if they're done right. And that is, they all, the very you know, parent, grandfather, the, the ultimate tags are HTML. Everything is, is within the HTML tags. And you put them at the very beginning and, and the very end. Um, and, and you can split that up from there into the head and the, and the body tags, right? <coughs> um, and so something that you might notice about this, this code that I have here on the slide is that there's a little bit of an indent from, from head and also for body. Uh, and the reason that we do that is for organizational purposes. So you can kind of imagine that the more indented you are, the more sort of, of a sub-tag you are, uh, if that makes sense, the more, the more nested tags you have around you. Uh, and the reason that we do this indenting is so we keep the code organized and clear. Um, and if you don't indent, then you create what people in web design call a foot gun, which is uh, kind of what it sounds like. It's a gun designed for shooting yourself in the foot. So in order to make as few foot guns as possible, we do things like organizing your code. So lesson number one. Uh, so what goes in the head, what goes in the body? Now I'm going to talk about that. <coughs> Within the head tags, uh, you typically have sort of, uh, I kind of think of it as administrative stuff. You have the title of the page, aka the, the text that goes at the top, uh, and that's title tag. You have links to your CSS and JavaScript files, so it knows which CSS files and JavaScript files it should be reading from in order to, um, in order to render the page. You have the links to the fonts that you're using. So as, as you know, uh, a lot of websites don't use Times New Roman uh, which is the standard font that you get in HTML, they use probably something else, right? So typically, we'll have something like Google Fonts. Uh, we'll take a pretty font that we like from there, and we'll link it within the head tags. So that's typically what's there. Also, sometimes people like to put their names, like by Andy Chin or something like that. So uh, there's also an author. Uh, but you can also put your name there, too. But the body uh, contains sort of everything else. One thing that I should note about the head is that typically the things that go in there aren't actually really seen unless you go looking for them. Uh, what the, the user primarily sees, and really the vast majority of any web page document, is the body. So uh, things to keep in mind. Really, the head is just sort of things you, you just get done. So you, know, you might be thinking, oh, this is really exciting. Uh, I'm having the time of my life here. Uh, but I understand it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of, um, a sort of list of things you just sort of have to remember. When, when doing HTML, because you know, it's, a, it's a markup language. It's not really uh, a logic-based programming language. Uh, you should still be logical. It's just, it's just um, really, it's, it's just a li list of tags that you should sort of keep in your back pocket. There usually aren't too many of them you have to remember, but let's just go over uh, a, f a few of them. So here's a list of, of tags. Uh, I'd say they're relatively f common. Um, and so 
Uh, because I'm a lazy teacher, I will not just go through each one of them and tell you what each one does. Instead, I want you to do them and tell me what they do. So how are you going to do that? Uh, let, let me direct your attention to a website called JS Fiddle. What's that? OK. So this is just so everyone can see, because uh, the projector is not as big as we'd like it to be. But uh, if you go to jsfiddle.net, you see something like this. Uh, please raise your hand if, if you have any problems getting to the site, and one of the TAs should help you out. Uh, but otherwise, this is what JS Fiddle looks like. It's really, really convenient for uh, just having small snippets of code and, and rendering them in the page to see what they would look like. So as you can see here, here's your little HTML uh, field. There's JavaScript stuff, which we haven't covered yet, obviously, and same with CSS. So for now, we're just going to work within this HTML field. So that way, you can type what I tell you to type in here, then press Run. And then that should run whatever you put in there. Right? So if I say Hi, I run it. The result, what do you know? It renders as Hi. So that with that in mind, I'd just like you to run these, uh, these tags, starting with uh, uh, H1. So, you know, if you already know what H1 does, you know, just uh, sort of uh, wait for the end. But I want everyone to try this out if they, in case they don't really know what the H1 tag does. Uh, in JS Fiddle, if, if you could, uh, just type this out. And uh, I'm going to wait a little bit and I'll see uh, what you guys think what happens. All right, I'm done waiting. Um, does, does anyone know what happens? Can anyone kindly raise you there? It is really big. It's very big. So if you're really angry, you use an H1 tag. Uh, H1 is not really an uh, arbitrary name. It stands for heading uh, one. Uh, you know, like not, not super commonly used, but essentially for headings, you know, you want them to be big. H1 is the biggest of the headings, and it goes down to something like six or seven, something like that. Uh, there, aren't, there aren't only six choices for size of font, by the way. We'll talk more about that later, but these are headings. Uh, how about these? So there, there are sort of three instances here, uh, and I want, I'll give you some time to fill that out. In the meantime, can I answer anyone's questions about anything that's happened so far? Question. OK, so the question was, do spaces matter? That is a great question. Uh, so it's, it, this is something that you can certainly test. But um, in fact, we can test it right now. What am I saying? OK, so if I just put a bunch of arbitrary spaces in here, uh, and I put in hello. One might think that it would render such that you know it, there's just as many spaces on the left and r and right, just like how I've run it. As I see here, it it doesn't really uh, indicate that. In fact, uh, the short answer is that spaces typically uh, do not matter because you can sort of program it programmatically uh, enter spaces and stuff. And we can talk about uh, how you how you do that. Uh, but essentially, what HTML reads is just the B tag, the hello, and this. Uh, spaces in between words, however should matter, or actually, rather, they don't either. It's rendered as one. Uh, but typically, like if you have more than one space, it'll render as, as just one. But there are ways of sort of separating words that we'll talk about later when we go th through the good stuff. But yeah, in case you ever, ever have any questions like that, you can always render them to in JS Fiddle, and you should answer them pretty quickly. But anyway, uh, OK. Can anyone tell me what the first one does? I'm mad. I hear bold. It is bold. I'm mad. You know, that's what it sort of says. Uh, how about the next one? It's italicized, yeah. So the B, you know, stands for bold, as you might guess. The EM is sort of short for uh, emphasized. So you, you emphasize the word fancy because, you know, it's around the word fancy. But how about the last one? See, one might think that it's just bold because it's the bold is closer to the I'm madly fancy. So, you know, you might think that it's just bold. Or, you know, someone else could argue, well, emphasis on the outermost, and so the outermost one should apply. 
but what actually happens? Both apply. When you're madly fancy, uh, both you're both emphasized and bold. Uh, so what does this mean? Well, it means that when you have uh, HTML tags that apply two separate rules, uh, everywhere, we, we can talk about what happens when there are conflicts and, and one, one uh, has one rule and the other has a conflicting rule. But basically, if, if nothing conflicts, you get something like this, where the, the um, <laughs> content in the middle gets impacted by both rules. So just something to think about. All right, how about this one? Would anyone like to venture a guess as to what uh, this A tag does? It is a link. That's correct. What is it linked to? Uh, it's the link to the best class ever, uh, which is conveniently what I wrote in the middle too. It's the best class ever. Uh, the A does, you know, it, it's an A because uh, the link keyword is taken up. We can talk more about that one later. Uh, but A stands for anchor tag. And essentially, whenever you want to link to something, you use an A tag. So that's how every link you've ever clicked on works. All right, try this one. It's a the URL is a little long, but uh, it's worth it. All right, what, what do people see? What would one think that the IMG tag does, given that it's the letters I and M and G? Right, right, but how does it know where to find that image? That's correct, yeah. So, you, you know, as you might expect, with a language like HTML, which, you know, doesn't like any ambiguity, uh, if you want an image, you know, it, you'll have to very explicitly say where that image is. In this case, I'm telling that the uh, image tag that my image is located at this uh, web URL. So it'll look at that web URL and look for um, this, this particular uh, file, tags.png at the very end. And so what is tags.png? It is, it is a picture. Does, does anyone see it? Cool. That's right. I found this little XKCD. Uh, how do you know I, a web developer? Notice how the tags are so incongruously egregious. That's, um, it is annoying, uh, so don't do that. But um, yeah, that's, that, was the, that was the image. OK, so here's an interesting one. Uh, what does the P tag do? I'll do this one with you. So, uh, you know, upon running just standard hello, I get you know what, what you usually see. Top left corner, you get hello, uh, Times New Roman. Everything's uh, standard and at the defaults. But when I run this, uh, I don't know if you saw that, but there was a subtle a subtle shift. Um, the difference between just standard, say H, is up here, but then when I have hello, it shifts down a little bit. Is that, did anyone else get that too? A slight difference. Uh, and so there, this is where we start to get a little subtle and a little bit hard to appreciate for now. But uh, essentially, you know, when you render what, do, what could P stand for, you get sort of the same thing, with, but a little shift. What basically happened was that um, 
what basically happened was that this, this paragraph tag, uh, for now you can think of it as creating an invisible box uh, and putting it around the content within the p tag. Now the box you can't see because the width is of length uh, is of zero and the height of the box, or I should say the width of the border around the box is zero everywhere, right? So it's it's just sort of, uh, you know, you, it's it's hard to appreciate. Like, well, wh why would I want that? Uh, the jargon for it is is called it's a block element now, uh, whereas before without the p tags it was just an inline element, meaning like inline with text. But uh, now that we're surrounded with this invisible box, it is a block element. Uh, and so you know you might be wondering like, well, what's that? Why is that? Um, you know, what what good does that do uh, for me? Uh, and you, that's a great question actually. Um, what you'll soon learn, and what we'll be talking about very soon, is what's known as the uh, the box model, the the CSS box model, where essentially Every web page that you've ever looked at uh, that you thought was you know, good looking or not was just a bunch of boxes that, was, that were stacked in a way that was, that was visually appealing. Like that's literally how all websites are, are organized is that they're just boxes um, and boxes within boxes, you know, sub boxes and it goes on and on and on. Um, and the one tag that we will talk about uh, very shortly that will literally sort of be the one true defining tag uh, is, uh, is this one is the almighty uh, div tag. So we will talk more about that. Uh, do we have a uh, comment? Oh, sure thing. Great question. So the question was, what if you want to put a, a tag on uh, in your, in your f uh, website that is not found on the internet? Uh, so just as there are web URLs, there are also uh, local file URLs. So essentially, um, and Sean will talk, actually, he'll talk right about this. But basically, if you have your image within your website's folder, you can source, for the, for the image source, you can just source it so it's like slash, uh, slash images sl slash uh, the name of the image file. So it's essentially the same thing. There's just no HTTP because we're not making requests to the web. We are just going within our own website folder. Any other questions? OK. Yeah, so the almighty div tag. We will talk more about this later, but essentially this will be uh, the, the one that you will use for the vast majority of everything you do um, and to be continued. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Sean now to talk about um, file paths. So yeah, just I, uh, before I continue, I just want to mention that today's class is a little bit weird in a way that it's not, usually we don't swap in the middle of the class. We just do it just for the first class because it's an introduction class. And starting from next week, what's going to happen is our Andy's going to do the first hour. And at the end of the class, there will be a 15 minute hands on session led by the TAs. And um, I will do the second hour. And there will be another hands on session for design. So that's how it's going to work. So, yeah. Um, so, there was a question about how do I link an image? to my own file versus how do I link an image to an image that's somewhere located on the internet. So this, I hope this slide will help, like, help you clarify that. Um, in HTML, in web design, or in almost any other programming, there are two types of paths. One is, one is absolute path, and the other is relative path. And absolute path is a complete path of file. It's, it's, it's uh, for example, if I were to say, um, what is the path to our website? It'll be HTTP www.wdd.io. And um, if I were to talk about a file in my computer, I would say, if I were to take a, a picture, say, I would put my entire path to this file from the root directory. So that would be users, Roka, downloads, images, let me take a selfie, dot JPEG. Everything is, is absolute, absolute path. And usually, um, when, you're use, when you're referencing an image to a file that's not on your computer, you use absolute path. But most of the times when you're making a website, you use your own image that's located in your own computer. So for that, we use this thing called relative path. And what relative path does is it's basically a um, truncated path that you use for um, the website. So for example, let's say you are on um, a folder called Roka. And if you're in Roka folder, you don't have to mention the entire path. All you have to do is mention the path from the perspective of 
the folder Roca. So it'll be just downloads <laughs> slash images slash let me take a selfie dot JPEG. So to give you an example, um, before that, before that, in web design we mostly use relative paths because we mostly use our own images rather than images from somewhere else in the internet. So for example, let's say you were on index.html. Let's say you are index.html. How would you access site.css? If you were to use, if you were to access site.css, how would you go about accessing it? Any anyone who can uh, take a stab at it? You guys are favorite in this. Yeah. CSS, so it'll be CSS slash site.css. It is. So what happens is, think of it as a user using a computer. You are on index.html, and to access, to open site.css, what you would do is you would click on CSS folder, and after you click on CSS folder, you click on site.css folder. Similarly, what you would do is you go to in code, you would write CSS slash goes into the folder and access site.css. And those of you who have programming experience or those of you who are pretty like comfortable using the computer, this might sound really boring, really easy. But trust me, like in a lot of our classes last semester, um, people really messed up with these path issues. So it is really important that you guys get this down now so that you guys don't run into these issues when you're using image tags or um, anchor tags. So let's try another one. So before, here what we did was we went into a folder. So how do you go out of a folder? If you are on Finder or Windows Explorer, what you would do is click on back or you go up. Um, in code, what you would do is you would type in dot dot slash. And then once you type in dot dot slash, it moves you out of a folder. So an example would be, um, let's say you are in index.html again. How would you access decal.html? So workspace and decal.html, they're in the same, same, uh, same folder, course C. And um, index.html is inside workspace. So how would you access decal.html? Exactly. So um, it would be you go out of workspace folder because you are currently in workspace folder, so you have to go out of it. So you do dot dot slash, and then once you're out of it, you are in C, so what you do is you do decal.html. Do you have any questions about absolute and relative path? So when you're making, yeah. Dot dot slash, dot dot slash, yep. Any other questions? Yeah. Two slashes? Two slashes. So before you had an absolute path and a relative path? Yeah. Oh, as in like uh, forward and back. Like you're talking about. Wait, I don't think we we never had like a backwards slash. I think so. What happens is in Windows, you use an inverted slash, the, the backwards slash. But on Mac and Unix and like most other operating systems, we use a forward slash. I think. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So the relative path is uh, UX UI UX UI. This. Um, That's a very, very good question. Um, um, you can. I think there is a subtle difference as to if you include a forward slash in the front of a path, um, it starts from root directory and stuff like that. But I think you don't have to worry about it unless you use a backend framework like Django or Ruby on Rails. If you get into the backend development, then it might matter. But I think when it comes to front end web development, I'm not quite sure, but um, let me answer that question later through private email, okay? Cool. Any other questions? Cool. So in web design, we mostly use relative paths. So don't try to type out the whole URL. Try to type out the URL from the file that you are modifying, okay? So now we're going to talk about developer environment. Um, developer environment has many different meanings in the programming world. A lot of programmers will disagree with this, but 
for this class, for this class, for this web design class, for non-programmers, we're going to refer to the developer environment as how you set up the, for, the file structure of your project. For example, if you take an English class, what you would do is you'd create a folder for English, and inside English you'd have essay folder, grades folder, and like stuff like that. So for here, what you would do is like when you're making a website, you want to organize your files. So we refer to the developer environment as how you're going to organize your files for your project. So for our purposes, what we're going to use is something like this. We're going to uh, have a folder called workspace. And inside workspace, we're going to have index. We're going to have an HTML file. And inside HTML, and in the same root, we're going to have an assets folder. Inside assets folder, we're going to have JavaScript, CSS, and images folder. And um, all the JavaScript will go inside JS folder. All the CSS will go under CSS folder. All the images will go under images folder. So let me show you how we're going to set up the environment. <laughs> it's, uh, so I open up Finder, assuming that we use a Mac. Um, so, so what I do is I create a folder called Workspace. <laughs> I try to make it larger. Larger. So from here, I create a folder called Workspace. And inside Workspace, I'm going to create three folders. One for JavaScript, one for CSS, and one for images. And what's going to happen is um, if you, I'm going to talk about this later, but um, the HTML will go inside, oh, I think, I, sorry, I messed up. Uh, there's a folder for assets. We're going to put these CSS images and JavaScript folders inside assets. So this is how your folder should look like for all of your projects and homeworks. So what should happen is if you were to work on homework one, you create a homework one folder. Inside homework one, you create a works, create assets. Inside assets, you'd create images, CSS, JavaScript. And your index should go in the same uh, uh, same root as the assets. And all of your CSS files should go under here. All of your JavaScript should, will go under here. And all of your images will go under IMG. Do you have any questions over how we structure the basic border wire structure? I'm going extremely slow. Cool. Any questions? All right. So now we're going to talk about what do I use to make a website? What software should I use to make a website? Unfortunately, we are not that good enough to make a whole new code editor for you guys. I think that takes years of research and effort. But there are some really good softwares that you can use. For web browser, this is very important for web designers. You web designers mostly have all of these web browsers installed on their computer. That is Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and sadly, Internet Explorer. They are better now, but for IE, like we've had history. <laughs> when you're making an app for iOS, it only runs on iOS. For Android, it, there are some fragmentations, but on a larger scale, it only runs on a on one operating system called Android. But for websites, websites run on many different platforms. Um, from web browsers, it can run on Chrome, Firefox, Safari. And in a lot of countries in Asia, they still use, there are a lot of countries where Internet Explorer is still the dominant web browser. So that's why you have to make sure that your website can work perf perfectly on Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and Internet Explorer. So um, I've read into a lot of issues. This is actually my weak point, uh, actually. I make a website for Chrome, and it just breaks on the next door. So you have to really make sure that it runs on all four browsers. So if you haven't already, please download all, all four browsers. Um, they are um, free. So yeah. And for code editor, so I recommend using, we highly, highly recommend using the software called Sublime Text. It's free. It, it is very lightweight. And you can use this software to, to create HTML files, 
CSS files, JavaScript, any files you need to make a website. So I highly recommend Sublime Text. Um, our, one of our TA uh, recommends using Text Wrangler. Text Wrangler, Sarah recommends using Text Wrangler. Um, I haven't used it, but I suppose it's good. And another candidate would be uh, Notepad++. Plus Plus. Um, and pick whichever you want, but we recommend using Sublime Text. And that's the software that we're going to be using throughout this class. And it is optional, but um, if you want to be a good web designer, uh, good web designer, like you, I recommend down using an image editor tool like Photoshop uh, for editing images. And you can, I also recommend using a prototyping tool. I talk about prototyping and. Um, <laughs> and the importance of prototyping next week in the design lecture. So for prototyping tools, I have recently discovered that presentation softwares like Keynote and PowerPoint, they're very, very useful prototyping tools. And that's what our sponsoring professor, Bjorn Hartman, professor for CS160, um, recommend. So we're, we'll be using these prototyping tools like PowerPoint and Keynote for our design section hands-on. So a typical workflow for a web design would be like this. You ask, we teach in order of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And likewise, we, you should code in this order. You should code, you should start from HTML, you should, and uh, you write the structure of your website. You write, ask like, when you write an essay, what you should do is, before you decorate your essay, you should first write your essay. And likewise, before you talk, think about the design, you write out all the structure, all of your content in a code editor. After you do that, you write the CSS. And I'll tell you how you should write the CSS um, right after this. Um, you do it by using this thing called Web Inspector. You don't, you never, ever, I don't recommend using your code editor to, use, to write your CSS first, okay? And then once you're, once you're done with that, you add, once you have your design settled, you have to make your buttons work, right? So that's when you write the JavaScript to add the missing functionality in your code editor. So let me demo how it's gonna work um, before I do that, I guess. Um, so I mentioned Web Inspector. So Web Inspector is a tool built into all of web browsers that allows you to test your designs on the fly. Um, you might, so for example, um, if you didn't have Web, Inspe Web Inspector, what you would have to do is you would write out the CSS code that, that, uh, that symbolizes design on your editor, and then you'd have to go to your web browser back and forth to try to see if it works. But with Web Inspector, you can write the code in your web browsers and see how it changes real time. So. Um, To open up a web inspector, what you do is, I'm going to demo this in a bit, in like three minutes. You right click on any web page. I recommend Chrome. You, um, in Chrome, right click and click on inspect element. And that's going to open up this window called um, web inspector. And a web inspector, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go over everything about web, web inspector, but I'm going to only go over the ones that you need to know. In elements tab, it's divided into two sections. On the left, you have all your HTML. And on the left, on the right, you have all of your design, the CSS part. 
And um, before I get into this, let me just demo how it's going to work. So let's say I go to live.wdd.io. <coughs> I'm in this page. And you can see that the website looks red. And let me try to change the background of this website to blue on the fly without using any code editor. So what you do is, again, right click, inspect element, and it fires up this window. And for a lot of you, what's going to happen is it's going to be like it's going to be anchored to the bottom. I personally like using it as a separate window. So what I do is I click on. I click on this uh, thing called this icon right here. Un undock to a separate window, and it's going to make the window its own separate window. And now what I can do is I can let me just resize a little bit. And um, now, right now, I'm on this section. And let me first, you don't have to know how the code would actually work. Just, I'm just gonna trying to demo you how to use a web inspector. So let me just try to find a background. So there's a cover background. Click on it. Try to find where the red is. And you don't have to know the CSS code right now. I'm just demoing again. So I t I'm going to change the background to blue. So I click on this. I type in some code. And it's blue. You can do this with any other website. You can go to Facebook. And I'm pretty sure like uh, you guys have tried like changing like download this like app, Facebook app that changes your Facebook bar to black. Those, those are all fake, but you can actually do it here. Um, try to find a blue bar. And you can see the blue thing right here. Let me try to change to change to color request. Green. Yellow. Green. green. Okay. I I changed to green. This is my favorite green. Oh, it didn't change. What the fuck? <laughs> um, let me try to change it. So if I leave some things on here, the top bars, like, they actually go away. Uh, oh, that menu, I think it's this. See how the colors change? But it's not going to change on your laptops because I'm only editing on my computer. Yeah. Okay. That would be a huge issue. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, you can see the benefits of using a web inspector because if you don't use this, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to go to this software, type in something like say like um, you're going to type on background. You're going to have to do this and color. Will green work? Not too sure. You're going to have to write this, go on here, and then like refresh, and it just takes up so much time. With, with the web inspector, you can just change. You can make the changes on the fly and see how it changes and make your decision um, more quickly. So, one of the questions that we've had a lot last semester was, after I make a change, how do I save the changes? How do I save the changes that I made on here to my actual code? So, to show you how you do it, let's say I'm on cover background. And I changed this to blue. And to save this, I go to Sources. And under Sources tab, there's a sidebar on the left. And you try to find your start your CSS file name. And in this case, we named it promotionallive.css. And you can see that there's, an, there's a star right next to the name of the file. And this indicates that this file has been changed. So what you do is you take the changed file, select all, Command A or Control A, copy, go over to your editor where you have the file, assume that this is the file, and you select everything and just write over it, just paste it, and you save it. And that's how you, and that's how you save a CSS file using a web inspector. Do you have any other questions? Yeah, uh, so think of HTML as the base, yeah. and you apply CSS on top of it. You can have a web page without CSS and just have JavaScript, or you can have a web page without JavaScript but just with CSS. But HTML is absolute must. And we're going to cover how you use Web Inspector more in detail next week. So you, it's OK you guys don't understand everything right now. But 
it's just really cool using Web Inspector to fiddle around with design of the website. So uh, just to recap, to add a new CSS rule, um, we're going to cover this again, uh, so don't worry. You're going to have to click on the plus icon. It creates a new style rule on the upper right. And to modify an existing, you just click on one of the things on the, on the sidebar and edit. And to save changes, you go to Sources tab and try to find your file. And Command-A, select everything, and paste it over, overwrite your file. And yeah. So just to summarize what I've talked about, the workflow would be you open up Web Inspector using right-click Inspect Element. You try to find the target for your, the change, um, that is background cover in our case. And then edit and modify the CSS. And then number three, you fiddle around, you just change until it looks good. We just happen to use a good blue and good green in our example, but you're going to have to fiddle around. And then once you're done and you're satisfied, you take your final code to your editor. And this is the workflow for the CSS part. So I highly encourage you to use Web Inspector instead of using a plain old code editor from scratch to code up your CSS file. Do you have any questions so far? <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. Um, uh, I think in that case, um, you're going to have to like, I'm going to cover that in my color lecture. Um, there's no good way to choose a color, but if you want to choose a different green, um, so let's say um, it's over here. And we're going to cover this again in, this, in the color lecture, but. Um, we use this in our example, but um, these codes, these hex, we refer to them as hex codes, these refer to a specific color. So if I fit around with the name, with the values, I say 7 to 5, it becomes a different shade of green and stuff like that. So you can use this, and you can, if you open, if you click on the square right here, it opens up this like a window where you can fit around choosing a different color. Any other questions? OK. So the summary of today, uh, we went over class logistics. We went over very basics of HTML. If you've already had programming experience, it might be a little bit boring. It's going to get better, I promise. Um, and we covered the almighty Web Inspector. And before we end, I just want to remind you that the homework one will be re released tonight via email. We have to use email just for homework one because you guys don't have the account for our WD portal. And um, homework one will take you step by step as to how to create an account on our software and how to use it, and et cetera. And the homework one will be due next Tuesday, and you're going to submit your assignment via our WD portal. So yeah, that's our first lecture. Thank you, everyone.